if I can show my listening audience out there that a lot of things that we believe or we have been indoctrinated with are false. They contradict the Bible. If you found out that something you were doing was contradicting God's word, would it matter to you? Yeah. Would you change it? Would you, would you think at least maybe this is not what God wants me to do? Colossians 2, and we're looking at verse 20, um, 21. These are the ones we're going to deal with, but we'll probably end up going right down to verse 23. Let's kind of see what happens here. Wherefore, if ye be dead with Christ from the rudiments of the world, why, as though living in the world, are ye subject to ordinances? Touch not, taste not, handle not, which are all are to perish with the using after the commandments and doctrines of men, which things have indeed a show of wisdom and a will worship and humility and neglecting of the body, not in any honor to the satisfying of the flesh. So the first thing I want us to do, there are some key words in verse 20 um, that I want us to look at in the Greek. And this first little word right here is nothing but a little conjunction in a subordinating or subordinate way. This little conjunction here can be translated since or if. And that's kind of important because if you look back at your um, English, it says wherefore, which wherefore if, and I'm not really sure why they put so many words in there, but this little conjunction here does not indicate uncertainty. So in English we use the word if to express possibility, uncertainty, etc., it is basically expressing a known truth from which a conclusion is drawn. So it's not if this, then that, but it is a conclusion. Wherefore, if ye be dead, that kind of sounds, if you're reading it, like there's a possibility that you may not be, and some people really are. <laughs> but I'm talking about in Christ now, all right? So, Let's take a look at this. This is simply here a Greek verb in the indicative, which means factual, but it is aorist, which means something in the past, and passive, oh, I'm sorry, active. I can really read that very good, active. All right, active, okay. So basically, either you died, or you could say you are dead, not sure how Paul wanted to express that soon with Christo, Christ. Apo, and this is with force. This word here, this little uh, particle is in the genitive, usually expressing from. We could put this in um, an intensified expression. So here we have if or since you died or you're dead with Christ from. And then let's take a look here. We have um, of, of, the, and here's a reoccurring word within Colossians. If you remember, the word here is rudiments. Boy, Paul really liked this word stoiakion or stoiakia because it also, if you remember, it appeared in 2.8. I think it appears three or four times in this book, being translated rudiments. Um, we could say elementary principles, we could, we could call it a bunch of things, but I want to identify something here very specific, and that is the genitive that follows, tu cosmo, of, that's the genitive, tu cosmo, of the world. So it is, it is the, the, the rank, the file, the, we'll call it, you're not going to like this. We'll call it the sheep walk of the world, right? And, and actually, in this particular day and age, it's going to fit real good. So we're not just talking about any type of order, but we're talking about things that are basically things that are ordered by and of the world. So then he goes on to say here, we have why, as though, living uh, in, in cosmo, here we have genitive, here is the dative, uh, in, 
the world. The dative makes it in, that genitive makes it of. And here's this word that I really want to focus on. It'll be basically the focus of pretty much the entire message. This Greek word, dogmatizeste, which we get our English word, dogma. Now, this is important because the way this is grammatically laid out, it is a verb, so action, indicative, factual, but it's present, which means something that started now, which continues into the future, and passive. What does that mean? Passive voice in the Greek means I stand still and something is done to me, right? Remember the three voices. You've got active, I do, I'm doing, I am the subject, I'm doing. There is middle voice, I do for myself, that is reflexive in the English, and passive, I stand still and something is performed upon me for which I am not acting or taking part in the activity of what is being performed upon me. So it is saying essentially do not subject yourself or do not let yourself be dogmatized. The question then at the root of this whole thing, what does that mean to be dogmatized? Now, if you look at this word, dogma, you're going to find that it was used. Um, there are more uses in the Septuagint and the Apocrypha. Believe it or not, dogma is used, I believe, in the Septuagint, but at least in some of the writings to express the Mosaic law. That ought to settle in for a second there of like, wow. So when it says, don't let anybody dogmatize you, I have to ask one thing. If we understood the teaching of the last several weeks, then let me read a parallel passage to you out of Romans 6 and see if we can make some, connect some dots. Romans 6 says, Know ye not that so many of us were, as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into his death? Therefore we are buried with him by baptism into death, and like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. For if we have been planted together in the likeness of his death, we shall also, you see all those italics, but the meaning of it basically is in the likeness of his resurrection. We, we shall also be in his resurrection, knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him, that the body of sin might be destroyed, that henceforth we should not serve sin. For he that is dead is freed from sin. Now, if we be dead with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with him, knowing that Christ being raised from the dead dieth no more, death hath no more dominion over him. For in that he died, he died unto sin once, but in that he liveth, he liveth unto God. Likewise, reckon ye also yourselves to be dead indeed unto sin, but alive unto God through Jesus Christ our Lord. Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body, that ye should obey it in the lust thereof. Neither yield your members as instruments of unrighteousness unto sin, but yield yourselves unto God as those that are alive from the dead and your members as instruments of righteousness unto God. For sin shall not have dominion over you, for you're, under, you're not under the law, but under grace. Now, the whole argument of Colossians 2 has been, basically, we've been looking at let no man judge you in eating and drinking. So you notice there is this don't get subject, subjected into all the dogmas and then after that, touch not, taste not, handle not. So it is clear to me, just from this analysis, that we definitely have first a little bit of insight as to what those Colossians were being clubbed over the head with by the false teachers. It was basically a form of asceticism, strict uh, regulations, and listen, I don't care where you turn, this is the tragedy of humankind. We are not content to leave well enough alone. I made a list, I've reviewed these, so don't, don't be mad at me, but it's the last time I'm going to get to do this because we're in this rudiments of the world, and I figured I'm going to do this one more time. I made a list, originally it was a list of 100, I cut it down to 50 because it was too long, but I made a list of 50 church traditions, You're, they are from, mostly from Catholicism. Um, there is a few uh, peppered in of Protestantism, but hey, if the shoe fits, wear it. So let's talk about these, and I, I've actually put them in order. 
And there's a reason why I'm doing this. I'm not just doing this because I like to pick on other people's doctrines because that makes me happy. No. Because if I can show my listening audience out there that a lot of things that we believe or we have been indoctrinated with are false, they contradict the Bible. If you found out that something you were doing was contradicting God's word, would it matter to you? Yeah. Would you change it? Would you, would you think at least maybe this is not what God wants me to do? Yeah. Or minimally, I know this is not of God, so I'm not going to call it a celebration that belongs to God. It's a celebration of man. And I, I can still celebrate that way, but I'm just not going to attribute it to the Almighty. So I start my... 50, my list of 50 beginning, and some of these are dated. Some of these have dates as to when these things crept in. About 108 to 112 AD, the need to bless the water in the church or in the font before using it. Division of clergy and laity, a complete contradiction of the Bible. Peter says we are a royal priesthood. That means every person who is born into the body of Christ and born into the kingdom of God belongs to a royal priesthood. It means that if you're really going to interpret scripture aright, Paul said God gave some, and he, he talks about the ministries given to the church for a purpose. God gave some pastors and teachers, and I highlight that one, prophets, evangelists, but all of these are word-based, word-based of the word. There was never an operation that God gave to the church that was separate from the word. That, that never happened. Anybody that says it did is a liar. Everything goes back to the word. The word is Christ. Everything goes back to Christ. Sorry. So division of clergy and laity, a contradiction of what the Bible says. You can especially for my Catholic friends, look it up. It's in First Peter's writing. Days set, set aside for fasting that were mandated. Um, this will lead to the practice of Lent in 140 AD. The, not the practice of Lent itself, but the days mandated days of fasting begin in 140 AD for the church. Why is this important? Because if you read the New Testament, there was never, ever a mandate given for fasting, ever. Jesus simply said, when you fast, he never said, you must fast. I demand you fast. I mandate you fast. He said, when you fast, don't go around telling people that you are. That's another thing. So think about this. We make a day. We mandate people to fast. Well, isn't that also telegraphing to other people that you're also fasting, which goes against the word of God? Sorry, but if you're going to call something out, I'm backing it up with the word. But there's something else that I want to talk about. And I covered this in another message. I said to you, there's a bit of review here. If um, this practice leads up to Lent, and Lent is supposed to be the foregoing or giving up of certain foods, which is connected to penance, I ask you the question, how could giving up chocolate or alcohol be commensurate with Christ's sacrifice on the cross? How could giving up food ever represent real repentance? And repentance is not another one of these, you know, badly translated from the Latin universe of repentance, which means to, in their universe, to flagellate, to beat yourself, to punish yourself, but rather the Greek word which I've taught you, metanoia, meta, with noia, the mind, change of mind, not beating the body. All right. So we know when the practice of Lent begins, 329 AD, a letter by Athanasius proclaiming a one-week fast before Easter. The following year, it is expanded to 40 days with essentially the prescription for the faithful, not universally, but it begins in one small pocket and it expands. It takes several years for the rest of the body to catch on and do likewise. So it was not a universal celebration. Councils and dioceses. Now, councils are biblical. Acts 15 proves that point, all right? But they didn't call a council in Acts 15 to add to the Bible. The Bible clearly, John clearly says, if you add or take away, basically you're cursed. You're not to add anything to this book. So I ask you the question, if you have a council and it's merely to debate, 
And there were many councils. In fact, I think I've shared with you, I took the liberty at the front of my Bible. I've got every church council that every, I took, wrote it out that ever took place to remind myself of what they discussed. And there were many times when they had to settle things like specific arguments. Who's right or who's right? I get that. That's not adding. But then they also held councils and decided to add things because that's what we do. We have to just keep adding to make more regulations and more rules to make it more complicated. So when I say councils, the type of councils that are in the Bible or council is biblical. But beyond that, to add, to, to then establish something that we're going to add to the Bible, no, that is against the word of God. By the way, uh, diocese is from the Greek word uh, diokine, which means control from the Proto-Indo-European word meaning clan. Just FYI. All right, the next one is 180 AD, the baptism of babies. I'm doing all this not because I like going down the list, but because in my listening audience, there are plenty of people who don't know these things. And it, it's sometimes, how could that be? The problem is that a baby cannot understand the why of baptism. So if you baptize a child, not that the child's going to go to hell because you baptize it, but the whole point of baptism in our theological universe is a public expression of faith that has already been cultivated, has grown, understands why you are in the faith and why you are a follower of Christ. Can a baby discern this? That's not to say that a child cannot be blessed. That's not to say that a child couldn't even be anointed. But in the truest sense of baptism, these are the things that I'm, I have issues with. Um, 374 begins the confession of sins to a priest. If you were interested, these are all A.D. Auricular confession is only expressed perhaps in type by James, and as I've said many times, James did not follow Jesus during his earthly ministry. This is why when you read James, James looks completely different than any other New Testament book. It contains, if there's any gospel in it, as Martin Luther said, it is a straw -y little epistle, no gospel therein. Um, but if you remember, it was James that wanted to have Jesus removed because he thought he was crazy. So it makes perfect sense to me that James would not know what Jesus said. Therefore, he's the one that basically says, you should go and basically confess to your neighbor, your brother. He's the only person that says that because we are not to do that. We are to talk to God. It is, if it's a relationship, I, I answer the question by my own rhetorical device. If I'm having a relationship with God, why am I having a relationship with someone else to tell God what I'm supposed to tell him directly? I don't get that, but whatever. 310 AD, the making of the sign of the cross on oneself or upon others. People think that Jesus did this. You see Jesus' hands in artwork a lot of times like this. This was a hidden sign to represent the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit at times when Christianity was either outlawed or Christians were under great persecution. They painted their art with a lot of cryptic messages. So if you see these things, he's not making a peace sign. He's not, hey, man, what's going on? No, that was the way they did that. But the, the, the making of the cross, I'm asking you this to really get, it's a thought-provoking question. If we truly understand what the cross represented in Jesus' day, and probably through the time, I'm going to say up until about the year three or 400, where they were still impaling people, by the way, would you be making the sign on yourself? This is, I wrestle with this a lot. Would you be making the sign of an electric chair on yourself? Because that's what is tantamount to. Now, we look to the cross differently, of course, because the cross is viewed as the altar where Christ died. But you have to approach these things and ask, as people wear jewelry, I'm not against somebody wearing a cross, or even people who feel that it makes them feel better to make the sign of the cross, but it is not part, was never mandated, Jesus never said, do this, Paul never said, do this, and we're only dealing with 
apostolic authority from this book or from the lips of our Lord. So I don't find it in the book, so I am not interested. That's my one-track mind. Wax candles, prayer candles, remembrance, and special services for the dead get implemented in 330 AD. You see about the year 300, a big shift between 300 and 400 is going to take place, and a lot of stuff is going to come into the church, which if you know the reason why, it might make sense back then. But as you come forward and we begin to progress in technology, the advent of technology, certain things don't make sense. So wax candles, for example, make perfect sense to me in, in the respect of in the dark ages, no electricity. Of course, you'd need a candle. You'd be standing in the dark otherwise. A lot of these churches, synagogues, and prayer houses were dark, cold, stark places. So of course, you needed a candle. But then in this period, about 330 AD, somebody came up with within the church saying, the candle represents the light of Jesus Christ. He's the light of the world in a dark world, so therefore we'll bring the candle in and make it a symbol in the church of Christ. I'm not against symbols, but don't make it something and then carry it so far as to say this has some value, salvific value. It does not. Veneration of angels and dead saints, 400 AD, even though the Bible explicitly says we are not I just covered this last week or the week before, not to worship angels. The Bible explicitly says that. You read the book of Revelation and John's writing, and he clearly spells out. We can read this in different places. So why? 394, the Mass as a daily celebration becomes routine. Now, I want to point something out to you. Uh, the late Dr. Gene Scott used to say, Mass comes from Massa, the the cakes they bake to the Queen of Heaven. This is true, but if you read the etymology of the word mass as a noun, uh, it's from the vulgar Latin, which carries with it Eucharistic service. But literally, mass literally means in English dismissal. Do you want to go to mass? Would you like to be dismissed? <laughs> I think I'm going to change the terms of our service here. And at the end, I'm going to say, and that's mass, right? <laughs> But it comes from, it's the feminine past participle, participle of the word miter, which is to let go. So when people, remember the word mass is going to get attached to words like Christ mass. And if you know the etymology of the word, it makes no sense. Christ let it go, Christ dismissal. I know, I, we know what the term mass has come to mean, but I'm a word person. So it makes no sense to me. And quite frankly, something else will happen a little bit later, which I'll get to. The worship of Mary, it is Celestine I who was the first to venerate her as Mary, mother of God in 422 AD. All of these creep in and then they stay. And you might say, well, wasn't Mary the mother of God? Be very careful of how you understand that phrase. Jesus was all God and all man. God the Father is God the Father, and the Holy Spirit is the Holy Spirit. Mary, I've said this many times, was a blessed vessel by God, but she was just a human being. She was not God. She was not, and I'll go on to, I'll point it out here in my list, she was not perpetually, she did not remain perpetually a virgin. She had Jesus as a virgin, and then she had other children, plus the fact I, I'm sorry, there's just too much here to deal with, all right? It's like, psh, right? It's just too much. Uh, transubstantiation, let's move on. 350 AD, and I say, please, to my Catholic friends, please read carefully the Last Supper. Jesus is speaking to his disciples. His blood is still in his veins when he says, take this, it is my blood representing the new covenant. It is representing, it is the icon of, it is not the actual blood. The doctrine of transubstantiation was promulgated by the Catholic Church to make the believers, the, the faithful ones of the flock, believe that as they partook, the bread changes into something mystical and the blood changes into, some, changes into the actual body and blood of Christ. That would make us cannibals. That's not what happens. That's not how the Last Supper occurred. You know, they didn't put Jesus on the cross and get a little cup afterwards and say, okay, we're ready. We'll gather the blood and then we'll go have our, our Last Supper. 
that's the way they'd like to kind of depict it as. It's not like that at all. The Mass replaces the Lord's Supper, 350 AD. So no longer called the Lord's Supper, it's called the Mass, replaced with lit lit liturgy. 14 on my list, the celebration of Christmas, 360 AD. And why is this on my list? I've addressed this before, but I've, I'll say it again. Jesus Christ was not born December 25th. Again, I go back to why do you think the words Christ, Mass, are even, again, whether you take the word Mass for the cake baked to the Queen of Heaven or Mass, as I just described, dismissal. We don't have the birth of Christ. We have a pagan celebration, and the church just took it on, and then it's celebrated as a holy day. And I have people saying all the time, okay, but Pastor, what's really the, the harm of that? Well, the harm of that is that you're not educating yourself. You choose to remain ignorant. I don't care if you want to celebrate December 25th, have a party, get together with your friends, your family, use it as an excuse to love on people. I don't care. However, it is not the day Christ was born, period. Let's just settle that. The doctrine of inherited sins and once saved, always saved pops up around this time too, which basically, biblically speaking, there is a saying about the sins of the fathers passed on to the children. Uh, this became dogma. So everything I'm looking at here is essentially a form of dogma of the church. Don't let yourself be dogmatized. I wonder how many people have let themselves be dogmatized. The monastic order begins about the fifth and fourth and fifth centuries. And why is this important? Because Jesus himself did not go into uh, environments where it was only religious people. He attacked the religious people. He attacked the religious hypocrites. He went into places where the rubber meets the road, where everyday people were. He didn't hide himself away under the guise that in order to separate himself from the world, he must seek some safe, recluse environment where he can study his precious word all day long. That was never the intent. But monasteries were needful before the advent of the printing press. That was the, it, basically its only use in, we'll call it in a good way, was to reproduce the Word of God, which they did quite well, seeing as we still have the Word in front of us. Uh, Pope Leo the Great, 440 to 461 AD, forbade public confession, but that was reversed by Gregory the Great. We had a couple of people that came on the scene that said, that's wrong, and tried to change it and tried to reform, but the power of the machine was too great. No, no, we need this back. We need to keep the people under our control. That's what it comes down to. Uh, the priests will begin to dress in lavish ceremonial guard to distinguish them from the laity. Purgatory, first spoken of in 320, becomes an official dogma of the church by 593 AD. There is nothing in this book that confirms or even acknowledges a concept of purgatory. And I, again, urge people to read this book carefully. It's very easy to take somebody's word, or it's very easy to take someone's word who is in a position of authority in the church and make it sound like this is what God wants, or this is what God wants you to believe. Listen to me. If God wanted an option of a middle place, he would have said, eeny, meeny, miny, mo." He said, these are your choices. There is heaven, and you serve God, and that is enter in, or there's hell. Refuse, be rebellious, and that is your abode for eternity. He never said, you know, if you can't figure out what to do, we'll put you in the middle place for a little while. It doesn't work like that, okay? By 600 AD, the official language of the church is Latin. Wait for it, because by 600 AD, Latin is considered a dead language. Now, if you're interested, from the time of Christ's death until this time, I just said 600, the Bible is already spreading like wildfire to different continents and different countries and being translated into different tongues. So why would you make the official language of the whole body, even in places where people do not speak Latin, Latin, we will force you Latin? Well, 
That means that the people would have to learn and in that day, people didn't have the luxury of learning. Some people barely spoke their native tongue. So now we have a method to keep people truly in the dark. We will speak to them and deliver the gospel in a, in a tongue they cannot understand, so they can't glean any benefit from it. And we can still come around and have the audacity to say, our coffers are empty. Fill the coffers. We might bless you, but surely you will not have anything except for what on earth did he say? That was a remarkable idea to make Latin the official language, don't you think? I was being sarcastic, of course. Celibacy is mandated by the clergy. Um, this is also not scriptural. Peter and many of the other disciples of Christ were married. And of course, God gave the institution of holy matrimony. The next one, you've heard me talk about Father, Papa, and Pope. These are all in direct defiance and contradict the word of God. Matthew 23, Jesus Christ says, Call no man Father. So why do we have a whole swath of society referring to men in religious garb saying, Father, confession, Father, I've sinned for you. We, we are, as David said, you speak to God, and it is to God alone when you sin, you sin against God. You may sin against your fellow man, but you first sin against God. Call no man father. So again, the term pope is papa, papa is father. If you can't see this, I'm sorry, but if you can see it, it should be exactly what John 8 says. Whom the Son sets free is free. You're, you're, you've been set free. Why would you want to go back to the bondage, either of the law or of any of these dogmas which don't do anything? They are man-made shackles to keep you bound, to keep you confused, and to keep you from actually having a relationship with God. If you can't figure that out, and I'm not being mean, I'm being actually heartfelt to say we're supposed to speak the truth in love. And I'm still heartbroken over many of the people that I know that keep going back to these ceremonies and these rituals, and they think there is salvation in that for them. And man, they're going to be really kind of, it's a big surprise when you wake up on the other side to find out you don't know the first thing about God. You only, you only learned about all the celebrations that man invented so that you can be the carrier of the world's garbage under the guise of religion. Knock yourself out. The doctrine of extreme unction. The, the doctrine of extreme unction, the anointing of the dying or the dead for forgiveness. Do you know how much that irks me right there? Because you cannot anoint someone for them to be forgiven. They must speak to God. They must talk to God. Forgiveness comes. Remember, I've taught on this ad nauseum. But you can't apply something to someone and therefore they themselves would be released or forgiven. It doesn't work that way. Unless you have done a wrong to me and I say, I release you. Maybe I don't even say it to your face. There, yes, but not with any, not with any anointing. That, that's actually in a contradiction to anything that the Bible says. So why would we Take this as dogma. Uh, Gregory I, the Catholic Church, is the universal church in 590 AD, which means essentially that there could be no other church. But by 590 AD, the church had already become the Roman Catholic Church per se, and the, we'll call it the, the straying off into paganism, into the grafting on of other ideas, even some ritualistic Judaism that basically got implemented. It becomes a hodgepodge. Boniface III accepts the title of Pope, another contradiction of Matthew 23. Leo was the first to come up with the doctrine of Peter being the rock, which, by the way, most people, when they read that passage, they believe Peter's the rock. But if you, if you want to put your trust on a man, that's all Peter was. Jesus Christ is the rock. And so I don't know how we get this confused, but it is. The canonization of saints in the 10th century. 
Uh, the established date of Lent and Good Friday, 998 AD. A careful study of the scripture could show Jesus was not crucified on Friday. Why we call it Good Friday? Good God, who knows? Prohibition of the clergy to marry in 1079 AD, enforced by Pope Gregory VII. Before this time, priest or clergy could marry. So before 1079 AD, priest clergy, anyone in religious service was free to marry. By 1123 AD, this is what makes me just absolutely go, okay, are you kidding me? By 1123 AD, conjugal relations for the priest were reduced in the eyes of canon law to mere uh, concubinage, which basically you can shack up, but you can't marry. You can shack up and have kids and not marry. And the church did an about face about this, basically reducing down all this, saying, uh, Council of Trent in 50, 1550 AD said, this made a man holier. Just go back and look at the men and those that served in the tabernacle and in the temple. God did not have any prohibitions against men marrying. So this, this demand for celibacy, which is a dogma of man, has produced the worst pedophilia Humanity has ever seen wolves in sheep's clothing, but God forbid we should let a priest marry because that would be, that would stain the man and make him unholy. So let's let him not marry and then he can have all these thoughts and not know what to do with him and goes out and does crazy acts because what do you do when you go insane? What? This is a dogma. Uh, rosary beads. Changing the subject. <laughs> 1090 AD, first introduced by Peter the Hermit, but popular, popularized by St. Dominic. Uh, by 1414 AD, the laity can no longer partake of the cup in mass. Uh, you've got purgatory then, proclaimed dogma at the Council of Trent in 1438. Let no one dogmatize you. Do you get what I'm saying? You, you have to connect it to these things. An idea that is introduced that then becomes dogma. Opinion of what is right, but not on the authority of God. But wait for it, because that too will get tampered with. Confirmation is introduced in 1547. Mardi Gras attendees are granted plenary indulgences in 1747. The Pope is called infallible in 1870. Now listen to me. I'm not trying to be uh, mean. But here's the problem with that, the Pope's infallible. We all are, including the Pope. And no law of man, no dictate, no edict, no declaration, no proclamation, no anything is going to change the fallibility of all of humankind. See, this is the thing, by the way. If I could just say this one message to American listeners. You know, right now we've got a lot of tensions going on and people are busy letting themselves, by the way, get pitted one another. We're not really doing it ourselves. We're letting people pit us one against another. But if we could actually stop and look at the big picture. I'll tell you what part of the big picture, part, a part of the problem is. People have forgotten that once you open up the veins of any human being, you got red blood in there. That's all you have. I don't care about where you think you come from or your lineage or how badly you were treated or how good you had it or where you came or how you served or how anything happened. You are going out the same way, maybe sooner, some later, maybe by a bullet, maybe by a heart attack, maybe by old age, but you're all going to go out. We're all going out the same way. Once you figure that out and you figure out, really, we spend most of our time listening to people who are dogmatizing us. Get it through your head. Once you break free of that and you understand, this is what being a Christian is about, the liberties that Christ has given us not to be in bondage again to the baser things, but to, to actually serve the higher. If we changed our view a little bit about these things, our world would change exponentially. 
Okay, I'm not through my list here, so I better hurry up. Gregory is the first pontiff to use the first phrase ex cathedra, full authority of his office implying infallibility. 37, Sabbath keeping, which is, as I addressed last week, a diversity of different groups in Christianity who still adhere to this. Um, Halloween, which you might say, well, I, I know that's not a Christian holiday. Well, you'd be surprised at how many churches in America actually celebrate Halloween. Did you hear me? This used to be, uh, this was a Celtic festival. I've taught on this before as well, um, that they used October 31st as basically a, a harvest. There was all kinds of different meanings attached to this festival. Um, then in the 8th century, Pope Gregory III designates November 1st to honor all of the saints. So you have something that starts to morph a little bit. Um, this, there's actually an interesting history, and I don't think I have time to do it, but the tangling, how you get this tangling, is that the Romans occupied in 43 AD, occupied a lot of Celtic territory. This Samhain, which is our version of Halloween, was a Celtic holiday. It got merged with two other Roman holidays, is brought back. Christianity becomes legal and okay by Constantine. And by that time, the merger of this holiday with popes basically talking about celebrating the dead. We have a celebration called All Souls Day and All Saints Day, remembering the dead, the dead saints, remembering the deceased were those that they don't know where they've gone. They merged it all together under a big basket. By the way, the original celebration of, I think it was called All Martyrs Day, was May 13th, but a pope moved it to the day that is now the day of either Halloween or the day after. And they actually imported it into the church. So if you remember when I taught on Martin Luther, by Martin Luther's day, this was a celebration of the church. And of course, I've shared with you some of the freaky things that they would do. They would put all of their relics on display on that day, and they'd get people to come in so that they could look at, well, this is the finger. This is the finger of John the Baptist. It's a little tiny thing right here. Listen, it's probably some chicken bone somebody threw away, okay? Uh, and, and for you to look at it, all you have to do is put a, you know, put a little silver in the box here, right? Eh, okay, if you're that silly, then, you know. P.T. Barnum coined it real good, so hey, if, you, if that's your deal, knock yourselves out. Easter eggs, Easter Bunny in the timeline of Christ's death in connection of pagan worship, the fertility goddess Ishtar, and other pagan uh, adaptations into Christianity. The bodily assumption of Mary proclaimed by Pius XII in 1950 AD. This one's a good one. You've got to listen to this, because this will show you how can you make something that was a theological a uh, hard point in, and reduce it down to a mere theory. Limbo. Y'all yeah, heard of limbo, right? Place where unbaptized babies who die. This place, limbo, was demoted from a firm, firm theological belief to a theory by the Vatican Council in 2007. Uh, I'm going to leave that one because I could say too much there. All right, the perpetual virginity of Mary. I've already talked about that. Uh, dogma 169, which is 43 on my list, seven sacraments of the new law. When people say seven sacraments, they're making it again into something that must be done. It's a mandate. Jesus only asked, and we, we have the words of Paul confirming it, to take communion, do this in remembrance of me. And if there's anything that we can connect to that, we could say taking communion, studying, praying, and possibly fasting, those things that are in Matthew 6. But beyond that, uh, if somebody says, well, you, you have sacraments and you've got to number them, here we have somebody now trying to make rules of what you must do. You must check the box, check the box, check the box, check the box. That is not a relationship. That's just being regulated. In the case of adult recipients, moral worthiness is needful in order to partake of the elements. I ask you a question. Can you see Jesus... Speaking to the woman who was taken in the very act of adultery, saying to her, before he tells them, he who is without sin can cast the first stone, can you see him saying to her, lady, you're not worthy 
for me to even talk to you, let alone be, can you, can you even, see, the whole concept is skewed. The words were never worthy, but worthily. The manner of partaking, not if you or I are worthy, will never be worthy. But you see how just a slight change from, uh, from just this, the, the term here, worthiness. Who is worthy? No one, but we're made worthy by the blood of the Lamb. So to tell people, you must be morally worthy. I told you about the story. I went to a church where they were going to partake communion. I was there as a guest. And I was mortified when the pastor got up and said, if this was in a, what I thought was a Protestant church, and I thought, wow, this is like dark ages here. Now, they're going to start lining up for the communion. And the pastor says, and if anybody here has unconfessed sin, I thought, whoa. Because, like, let me just say something to you. See the flaw right here of anybody who's got unconfessed sin? I think that in between the time he said, if there's anybody here with unconfessed sin, and the time that I was thinking, I must have sinned about a dozen times. <laughs> the first one was, what can I do to shut that person up? Because <laughs> that is heresy. The second thing was, if I really could do something, what would I do? See, I'm telling you how much I sinned in just a small amount of time, because that is... It's not even solid doctrine. It's just gibberish. No one is worthy. No one. Not me, not you, not the Pope. But the manner of partaking, to make sure we're discerning, that we're not just doing this like, oh, we're just taking the cup of wine like it's another drink of any kind, or we're not taking the bread, but we're discerning. We're looking through them to look to Christ, to look to his finished work, period. All right, moving on for the priest to... The absolvo is in contradiction with the scripture. Mark 2, 7 says, Who can forgive sins but God alone? So no man can. That is in contradiction. The granting of indulgences, the sacrament of penance. I ask you again how penance can be a sacrament. You are either in the mindset of changing your mind, and if a change of mind has come, metanoia, what may follow the concept of metanoia, we've talked about this before, is metomelomai, which is feelings of grief and sorrow for what you've done against God or against your fellow man. But this idea somehow that you, by beating your body, by hurting and inflicting pain on yourself, you're pleasing God? Can you even fathom or find this anywhere in the book? Because I cannot and I do not. Uh, Okay, moving on, the Pope has jurisdiction over every church. Hello. Uh, Mary conceived without sin or stain of original sin. And last but not least, I had to add a little uh, Protestant jib in there, which is the prosperity gospel. I could have gone on. Actually, as I said, it's pretty unfair because the first 50 are mostly Catholic and the last 50 were mostly Protestant. And there are a lot, by the way. We're not, it's not like, oh, they did all this and we did nothing. No, it's everywhere. It's in every faith. Religion that becomes regulation has no connection to righteousness, has no connection to God, and you're going to be back basically in bondage to some form of dogma. So let me go back here and let's look at my text one, once more because the thing that I want us to walk away with today is, and especially, I do this especially for my listeners who may not be familiar with what I do here. I'm not out to bash somebody's traditions or hurt somebody's feelings. I'm out here to tell you, if you are trying to follow the Christian faith, you should be desiring the most authentic and true that can be in this day and age. And I'm saying there are things that we cannot uh, fix or there's things that we have to work around, but these gross manipulations of dogmatizing people under the auspices that it's the church, you will follow what we do. The church has scared away more people with its rules and regulations. It has made people think that the church and Jesus Christ are nothing but a judge sitting with mallet ready to condemn your every move because you are a sinner. You are and so am I. But that's not the message of the Bible. If you want the message that counterbalances everything that I've talked about against being dogmatized, 
The complete opposite of this is the just shall live by faith. That is the opposite. If you're looking for an understanding to what Paul's argument is, look, I could have taken you to Romans 7 where Paul talks about a concept of basically, figur figuratively speaking, he addresses a husband and wife and he says basically if, if uh, the husband is livid, she's married to another man, she shall be called an adulteress, but if the husband dies, he's speaking of the old dispensation, the law versus the new dispensation that we, we have been set free for this liberty. So my question is, why would you or I let somebody come back and put and impose a set of rules on you? Now, I have people that come and say, well, what is the structure of the church? And, and what do you have people do? This is a faith ministry. This book speaks more about faithing. You go into the chapter Hebrews 11, the heroes of faith. It doesn't say by their works. It doesn't say by their rules or by their regulations or by their omissions or by their commissions or by their counsels. It says by faith. So and so was saved by faith. They achieved this by faith. They entered into that land. Nowhere does it say by rules and regulations. So we have a whole universe out there that will never set foot in the church of Jesus Christ because they believe that the church is all about dogmatizing. And if you will not come under that dogmatizing stigma, you can't be in. That was never the church of Jesus Christ. Jesus basically took away, he did away with all this. And what I can tell you, I itemize these here because they speak volumes to me. If we have fellowship with him as Paul is addressing over and over and over again that union with Christ, and we have fellowship with him, and we are partakers in the likeness of his death. It means to me, I'm no longer worried about the world. I'm no longer worried about the mandates and the dogmatizing of the church at large. My concern is, am I pleasing to Christ? Am I doing what I'm supposed to do for him? Am I faithing? Am I relating and having a relationship with him, not am I following the rules and checking the boxes, which I said will never be. That will never be anything that God expected, wanted, asked for. And those who press for it, I can't tell you, I really believe there's a special place for those people reserved in hell to convince people somehow that what God wants from you is for you to perform like Pavlov's dog. No, what God wants for you is to grow in a relationship with him where you can trust him, where you can talk to him because he's the one you will spend eternity with, not these rules and regulations. Now, the takeaway from this, as I said, we're dead to the law. Paul's big argument to those folks um, who are being dogmatized, if you will, and that's probably going to end up being some part of the title here because that's been a big part of the message. But I want you to take a look again when he says, why do you subject yourself? Why do you let yourself? Remember, that's passive. It means that you stood still and you let it happen. You had to say, oh, that's a good idea. Okay. Well, that sounds good. Instead of saying, I need to check this out. We have a Bible. You're able to go and check out, is this in the Bible? Is this Christ's words? Is this from God? Or is this from man? We have been set free. And then these three things I find interesting. I want you to look at something. Touch not, taste not, handle not. The touch not and the handle not seem like semantics. But I think this has to do a lot with these three words, touch, taste, handle. I believe these are words that these troublemakers that came to Colossae were using. And Paul says, not common in his writing. So I see this as little buzzwords that he put in there that they were using, essentially throwing it back in their face. Don't let anybody dogmatize you. Touch not, taste not, handle not, which are all to perish with the using. Listen, if you've been set free, all of these other things are not as well. They have no use. If you believe in the power of Jesus Christ, that God raised him up from the dead and he shall, he shall be essentially there, we shall see him and we shall be like him. Why would you subject yourself to these things that bring nothing and they are not part of the church? This is why I believe people are so ready to accept because they don't read, they don't study, they don't educate themselves. We are dead to the rudiments 
Colossians 2.20, we are dead to the world. Galatians 6.14, we are dead to the law. Romans 7.6, you keep looking at this and you say, it is indeed a very simple conclusion. This is why he opens the third chapter with, if ye then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God. Set your affection on the things above and not on the things on earth, for ye are dead and your life is hid with Christ in God. In other words, all this stuff, you Colossians, you're letting yourself get distracted. Somebody's going to rob you of your reward. You're going to end up in the wrong place. Get focused again. Get back in line. Start looking to the right direction. Start fading in the right place and quit all this nonsense about, I got to have these certain rules. I took the time to read all these dogmas to show you that it wasn't just in the Colossians day. But in this day and age, how many people do you think have been dogmatized by the church and they're not even aware there's no biblical foundation, there's no biblical ground for these rules and regulations. These are made-up rules by people who weren't happy enough to let people come into the church and grow in the measure and stature that Christ desires us to grow. But you can't grow under rules and regulations. You cannot grow under circumstances that are prohibitive to cultivate and grow a relationship. So if somebody, the next person asks me about uh, dogmas, I actually have something ready to say to them. As, as for me, I'm not interested in rules and regulations. I'm interested in one thing, having a right relationship with God, that at the end of everything, someone's idea or interpretation that wasn't part of this book will not only not mean anything, it will burn up. It will be nothing. Those people who stood by ceremony. Look, I, I make no secret. I've told you, the amount of people, they have a diversity in the listening audience here, people from all walks of life. You can be dogmatized, not just the Catholic Church, as I said. The Protestant Church has done it with its strange doctrines. Judaism has done it. Even Islam has done it. You find in every religion, Human beings are not satisfied to just take this, here's the direction, walk in it, but no, we'll make a whole bunch of encumbrances upon you where you can't even do the thing. This is what the law accomplished to the children of Israel where they were so bound, there was nothing that could be freeing about the law. We've been freed from that. We have been set free by Jesus Christ. So my words to you and especially to my friends and my listening audience if you're offended by the things I've said today, take the time to read this book, confirm what I've said, because they're not my opinions, they come out of this book. Find the truth for yourself and let it set you free. But if you're gonna be a Christian, you're using this book, not the doctrine that has been invented for other reasons, for convenience or whatever. You're using this book as your roadmap for eternity. If you get that, I think you got it all. That's my message. You've been watching me, Pastor Melissa Scott, live from Glendale, California at Faith Center. If you would like to attend the service with us Sunday morning at 11 a.m., simply call 1-800-338-3030 to receive your pass. If you'd like more teaching and you'd like to go straight to our website, the address is www.pastormelissascott.com.